Hello, thirsty friends and family and fellow sojourners. I want to welcome you to session 14 of our Genesis study. And uh, I've got a lot packed in here today. I, I won't promise you that we can get through the 12 pages of notes that I have in one session. I may need to go ahead and break this up into a part one and part two because I'd like to cover chapters 14 and 15. They seem rather small. Um, there's actually only 24 verses in chapter 14 and um, 21 in chapter 15. But there's so much in here, y'all that um, one chapter would be a study in and of itself. But I do want to get through it because they're so interrelated with each other. And so I think it's fitting that we include both of these chapters in this session. Uh, so this will start out part one, I'm assuming, and... If I happen to get through all of it in an hour, then yay. But if not, we'll take a break, regather, and jump right back into part two. But before we get started, let's go to our real teacher. Lord Jesus, Father God, I begin this with you every time to thank you for the privilege to study your word. Lord, it is such an honor and a blessing to scripture mine and look for you throughout every scripture. You're on every page. Father, you have revealed yourself in, in so many glorious ways in what we've already seen in our study in the book of beginnings. Lord, you know us from our end to our beginning. And as we have seen you create the world that we're residing in right now, Lord, and your promises and the picture of redemption that you've placed before us right from the very beginning, Lord, the sacrificial system that you introduced us to in the garden, Lord, we thank you as, as these words jump off the page and become alive. Lord, you are the word become flesh. And so it is with great privilege and honor that we have the opportunity to discover and learn more of you and receive light and revelation on you, Lord. We pray that you Bless this study, Lord, that you open our eyes and ears, Father, so that we don't miss one thing that you would bring to us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit who leads us to all truth. Father God, in a time when people do not want truth, we come to you seeking earnestly your truth, your light, your revelation, your heart. Lord, we thank you. We bless you and we honor you in the study. In your name, Yeshua, our soon coming King, our Messiah, we bless you. Amen. So I try and find relevancy in these times that we're living contrasted by what we are learning in our studies and as we are all very well aware of the circumstances that we're under in our country and honestly the delusion of so many people the usurping of God's commandments and our rights as Christians to continue to study and worship and gather. Uh, the things that are unfolding are very concerning, not unexpected, 
And I remind all of us that we are uh, just pilgrims. You know, we left off with with Abram and God renewing his covenant with him, his promises for the generation and, and his seed that would come through Abram. He, he found favor with God. And I think it's important for us to hold on to the fact that Abram was not born a Hebrew. It was through Abram that the Israelites and Hebrew nation would be developed. He was a pagan Gentile, just like the rest of us. And so uh, he believed God. He came from a time shortly after they depart the ark. And we've gone over the story of Noah building the vineyard and the indiscretion with Ham and um, the cursing of Ham's line, really, um, Cain, the Cain that would come through Ham, not Abel and Cain, because remember that was pre-flood. Um, but shortly after they departed the ark, there's all of this usurping of um, mythology, other gods. We've covered in quite a few of our sessions how there were the Greek mythologies and gods and stories, even with Nimrod, who's going to surface right here in chapter 14 again in, in a small way, um, how they, they took those things in the heavens that the Lord created and um, that gave the picture of his gospel, his redemption, all of those things that we once again are seeing in Revelation, but they, uh, the enemy always will try and replicate what the Lord God has done, is doing, and will do. And so they did, they um, kind of perverted the, the Maseroth and turned that into astrology and came up with all kinds of uh, mystical, celestial other gods and that sort of thing. So it was not unusual. You recall we talked about in Ur, there were many who worshipped the sun and the moon and uh, Abram, uh, you know, obviously came from, from that. He was very, uh, you know what I like about Abram is that he was consistent in, in what he believed. You recall he was a very wealthy man. He had a big decision to walk away from a life that he was accustomed to and and to believe God. This was a huge thing. And that's why he's known as the father of faith. He's also referred to in scripture as the friend of God. So many marvelous things. There are some things about his character that I think that I can recognize in, in my own personality. Specifically, you know, oftentimes... You recall sometimes, if I can draw back, I don't know if you recall, but I had mentioned in one of our sessions that sometimes our strengths are our weakness, especially if we're really good at something. Uh, we don't feel like we need the Lord as much in those things that we are confident in doing and really good at, to be quite honest. And... Um, Abraham, and especially in the business world, I have always been a person who took accountability and ownership of what is in front of me. And, you know, as much as I would like to say that I daily in the work and my tent making that I do 
seek the Lord's direction and counsel, um, but I don't. I often do, but I can't say that I do it daily. And there are things that I do really well that I just kind of go into automatic mode. You know, this is this is how this works. This is what we do. This is how I'm going to handle this and manage this. Um, so Abram was a lot like that. And I wanted to mention that fact because, you know, he was very uh, self-sufficient in a sense. And we see that when uh, he finally does leave the um under the direction of the Lord, and, and he leaves and, and starts his journey into the promised land, but shortly after, there was the famine in the land, and, you know, he didn't really even talk to the Lord about what he should do. He found himself in Egypt, and remember, he had to ask his wife, Sarai, to misrepresent herself and, and, and being his sister, which wasn't really a lie because she was a half-sister, but yet it was still a misrepresentation. And so that was not a good thing, as, as we know, although he came out of that very well as far as plunder and wealth because he was treated really well when he was in Egypt and he got kicked out and merciful, mercifully, um, they made out pretty good and made it out, um, but he made a bad decision, a bad call without asking the Lord's direction. Now, where we are today, we're going to find ourselves in what I like to refer to the War of the Thrones. I don't know if any of you saw that series. It, it's, it's one of my favorites. And um, we kind of got this happening right now as we start out chapter 14. We left Abram um, after his renewed promise. Lot, as you recall, had pitched his tent towards Sodom, and we talked about how Abram was operating in faith, and Lot was just operating by sight, which sometimes fails us. So we're going to get into the War of the Thrones, and this is exciting to me, simply well, for, for so many reasons, but we're going to be introduced to um, Melchizedek. And the Lord so graciously gave me revelation on Melchizedek. And, and I, I can't wait to talk about that. But um, I, I wanted to kind of preface before we actually get into this war. Um, and what this was, the War of, of Thrones, the War of Kings, it's often referred to the War of Nine Kings, the slaughter of, Ch I can't say the name, y'all, you know me, Chedor Lamar, Chedor Lamar, Chedor Lamar, it's the king of um, Elam. Or it's also uh, referred to sometimes as the Battle of Sedim. And basically what it was is um, four Mesopotamian armies war against the five cities of the Jordan Plain in that area um, where Lot was, the east and the west, and basically the promised land, really. And the Jewish literature, the, the rabbis and the sages, uh, they've translated in the Targums. And uh, I, I don't think that I've explained what the Targums are, so I want to do that for any of those who don't know. Um, basically, the Targum was the translations of the Torah. And early in the temple and all of that, you know, most of the um, scriptures were read and interpreted by the Jewish sages. And um, the Targum is, is honestly like a commentary, really, um, from way back when. And so a lot of what they say, as far as the Jewish rabbis and the sages, 
are very credible. Some things aren't. And so again, I uh, just can't mention enough how, you know, we have to receive the word with readiness of mind. And then Acts 17, 11 tells us we are to be like the Bereans and go and search the scriptures to see if they were so. Because, as you know, everybody has an opinion. And it doesn't make it so, even if it is a um, rabbi. Uh, it just doesn't. So, you know, some of these are really good, but I wanted to point out that in studying for this session, I was able to uh, come up on some interesting information for consideration. I'll, I'll just say that because I had prefaced this with saying that Abram sometimes made some decisions without the direction of God. You know, he just kind of went into automatic mode, which we all kind of have a tendency to do sometimes, action, reaction. And so I was, uh, that did not escape me when we look at the first verse um, explaining the War of the Kings, there was nothing here in Scripture that that um, indicates that there was any counsel that Abram made to the Lord God about what it was he should do. And so I, I found that very interesting because he just made a decision um, without the counsel of God to go into Genesis, to go into Egypt. And so it looks like he's going to do it here again. And so I've got a point to make here. The Jewish sages and the rabbis, some of them actually suggest that, that this was actually a spiritual war. It was obviously very physical um, as well, but that it was actually directed towards Abram because if you recall he's coming out of this land that is serving and worshiping multiple gods and so the rabbinical um, or the Jewish scholars um, assert that Nimrod was um, the king let's just go through the first verse and then this will make sense um, because I'm going to read through this, the War of the Kings, and I'm going to give you their names, although you probably won't remember them. Again, if scripture mentions it, I think that it's very important that we mention it as well. And so the War of the Kings, verse 1 of Genesis 14 says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Remember, uh, that's where Nimrod was. Ariok, king of Elsar, Shaddad Lamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shanab, king of Adma, and Shemember, king of Zebian, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. All these were joined in the Vale of Siddim which is the Salt Sea. So right around the Salt Sea. So basically what this is, is, is four kings from the north. And they're going to come against these five cities down in the Jordan Plains. And what's important to know, although it doesn't mention it here, it says in verse 4 that 12 years they served Chador Lamar, and in the 13th year they rebelled. And so with some deeper scripture mining, we learn that these um, cities in the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah and um, Adma and Zeboin and, and Bala or, or Zor had been paying uh, tri tribunals, I think. I don't know what the word is, but essentially they were under the governance of this uh, King Shedelamor, Shed Shador Lamar, Shador Lamar, Shador Lamar. Okay, you guys have to get in here and, and interpret this for me. So then they decided in the 13th year, you know what, we're not paying this guy anymore. 
And so anyway, what happened was they kind of all came down and, you know, just waged war on these cities. And um, they wound up actually taking Lot um, as part of that. And so they came in, you know, to each of these cities, took, took all of their all of their belongings and, and the things that were valuable that they wanted when they got to Sodom. Obviously, we know now that um, Lot was actually right in there. So they took him and all his stuff and w someone escaped and, and went and told Abram that Lot had been captured. And so this is where it's interesting. Um... Because it says, um, you know, they went right to um, Abram, the Hebrew. And I love this because this is the first mention of Hebrew. Um, so they knew where he was. They went and told Abram. And then when Abram had heard that Lot was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house. There were 318. We're going to get to that number here in a little bit. And then he went after them. And so there's not, he, he was very successful. So I just want to get that point out. He was successful in this war. Um, but he didn't, there's, there's nowhere in here that it says that Abram really conferred with God, you know, he just, he gets this message that Lot's been captured, that, you know, the, this, this war is going on and he just jumps into action and he takes the 318. So as I was saying in my notes, the Jewish scholars tend to interpret that this war was actually against Abram and it was a spiritual war um, and, and they actually there are a lot of people who believe um, the very first verse in this war of the thrones and it came to pass in the days of Amphraphiel king of Shinar so we've gone over extensively uh, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, how people were using their known technology at that time, elevating their self. We, we talked about even how as Christians, some of us can be in chapter 11, where we learned about the Tower of Babel, or in chapter 12, where we actually are called out and called into union with God, and we have to make a decision on whether he will be the Lord of our life or whether we will continue on with what we would have for ourselves. And it's, it's a very uh, subtle thing to understand that sometimes we're not really acting on behalf of God. We're, we're still pursuing some of the things that we want to pursue. And so, you know, I tend to agree that there, this was a spiritual warfare. Uh, this was a land infiltrated with vile and so much idolatry, uh, just horrible, uh, despicable things going on child sacrifice um, just things beyond our comprehension and Abram as you recall he was set apart to in in this environment to be a witness of God God Almighty the one and only true God creator of heaven and earth and so as we know as Christians there is always spiritual war and opposition between God and those who represent him we see that now today this year in our nation we see the despicable and vileness that is 
no less representative of what they were doing back then. It's just as bad. Remember, as in the days of Noah, and remember the Lord saying, I will not always toil with men, for they are flesh. So, um, it is not, it, it's plausible to consider that uh, this war was truly an attempt to capture Lot in order to draw him into the war and kill him, essentially, because that's what they want to do. Um, but, uh, you know, we can find those hints. So I'll leave that there for you to consider. Um, I also, I don't think I mentioned it, although I took us back to verse 1, that Amphriel, king of Shinar, um, a lot of the uh, Jewish scholars and, and many others, especially in um, mythology and, and other things, indicate that Nimrod actually was this king. Now, uh, what I want to point out is that, as we've discussed in some of our other sessions about that spiritual warfare and that spirit of Babylon. And so uh, in Genesis, it uh, was talking about, um, let me see, Genesis 10, 9, um, you know, Nimrod was, was known as the, the mighty hunter, um, and his vileness and, and his wanting to elevate himself and, and, and become God and, um, the expression is found later and I have to find that because I didn't put it right up there in my notes. I'm sorry, my 12 pages, I didn't put that there. But at any rate, further in scripture, we find um, that um, everybody's like Nimrod, the, the spirit behind these awful kings, but every king is not Nimrod. Um, a lot of people say they are the same because they did the same things or they were operating under the same expressions. Um, so at any rate, there is also something that I found interesting because I'd never heard it before, but apparently, and uh, scripture doesn't support this. Um, and so you, uh, I don't really know if I should even mention it, but I found it very interesting because there was a correlation to the Hebrew children being thrown into um, the fire pit. And we all recall that story. It's one of my favorite stories as it relates to faith. And you'll remember this again was in Babylon and they would not bow to the king and uh, made the declaration that, that God was able to save them. But even if he doesn't, they would not bow. And I want to stress, but even if he doesn't, because as true followers of Christ, we're going to have those, but even if he doesn't save us, we will not bow to you. And so there is some suggestion that Abram was um, kind of really had a, a mark on his head and that there, and, and this isn't so many of the resources and um, not only the the rabbinical literature, but also in, you know, some of the other books, like the book of Jasper, the book of um, Barnabas, and, and those that were found with the great scrolls. And so there, it lends some credibility, but there is mention of this um, King Amraphel, indicating or condemning Abram to fall into the fiery furnace. And it's 
talked about a lot. So um, there pretty much was a, a there was a um, there was a mark on him, and some even suggest that you know he did he was placed into the to the fiery furnace and came out, which um, I just don't really see that because I think that the Lord would have inspired that to to be included in the canon and it wasn't but the relevance of that you know being sentenced to or to fall into the fiery furnace and the Hebrew children is is very ironic to me but you know at the same time I think that a lot of people fall into the fiery furnace um so uh, it, it is not far-fetched for us to recognize that this was a call to action for Abraham as a witness to God and to oppose what he was up against. And so I wanted to mention that because I said I'd like to find some relevancy that we can correlate with what's going on right now. And um, I'm just going to say this. I have been so disturbed, and as you know, I'm pretty vocal about it in regards to the condition of our nation right now, especially surrounding this election and the call to action as Christians that we have understanding what a Biden and Harris administration would look like in regards to our freedom and our liberties to continue to worship and to be a free country. And I believe with everything in me that as Christians, we are to stand and, and, and to come into action when we are standing on what the Lord commands, His heart, His character. You know, so many different issues as it relates to even abortion in this country and the millions and millions and millions of babies that have been sacrificed. There is no other word and I've mentioned this it's probably the fifth or sixth time that I've mentioned how God feels about that and the shedding of innocent blood. And we see all of this in that error that Abram was in with these idolic with this idolatry and I think it's very important to recall we we talked I don't know if it was last session or the one before about the Tower of Babel and that spirit and that usurping and becoming like gods and using technology and the astrology and building the tower and how you know, the Lord came down in his trinity, us. I love when he uses the plural form for the trinity and confused them and scattered them. And we are at a time in history now that there are so many people that understand um, different languages. They're, they're bilingual, trilingual, and, and some so much more than that. So that language is not a barrier is the point. And the technology is coming together now to once again build that Tower of Babel, to institute that one world order, and to um, deny and rebel against God Almighty. And so it's particularly urgent as Christians that we come against that. If we have the living God, a portion of, of the Holy Spirit residing us, we can't sit still. And so, you know, 
I, I think that Abram jumping into action right here, although it doesn't say that he uh, conferred with the Lord, he recognized the spiritual warfare and essentially the war of the thrones. And we know, as we have been in our study of Revelation, how often throne is mentioned. We have one God, one King, and we will not bow. And so I view the selection. We know that he is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, well, I have seen so many people walk away, and I listened to a sermon last night from someone that uh, I still have great respect for, and essentially I have been aligned with most everything that he said so far, but there was a turn last night that I noticed in his message. And it was a sobering reminder, and, and, and I call us all to be reminded again, you know, just like Abram, we are looking for that city not built by hands, you know, we are looking um, to be in our home with God and and so we understand that we are pilgrims here in this world we happen to reside we've been placed in the United States and we are called to occupy um, and so this particular um, sermon that I listened to last night was you know just a reminder you know when you're in the middle of um, the spiritual warfare, which we have all been in during this election, it, it, it's sometimes easy with the adrenaline and the fiery darts and everything that has been coming towards us um, to kind of lose sight of the fact that we're pilgrims and we are we've got our eyes up and we're waiting to be raptured. We're waiting to be raptured. Um, but the point that the um, gentleman last night that I was listening to made, you know, he kind of came up against Trump in, in some sort as of um, Christians looking to uh, President Trump as our savior and our hope. And we'll find in this particular war, when Abram meets with um, Melchizedek, all the glory and the honor goes to God Almighty. I don't think any of us are looking as Christians, as Trump, as a savior. We understand what he is holding back in this country and what being in an administration will look like for someone like Biden, which essentially can be described as this first king, the king of Shinar. He's a despicable, immoral man who wants to sell this country out and it is, there's nothing good about it. And, and the worst part of that is the war on Christians and Jews that we can anticipate. So while we, we appreciate the governance from President Trump and his integrity and everything that he's done for this nation, but also most importantly, defending our right as Christians to worship the God we serve and to keep a hedge around us from having to be forced like the Hebrew children to bow down 
to other gods and this one world order. And so it was a little far-fetched. It just kind of truly, you know, he read a letter from a, a Christian who, you know, can't stand Trump and has a hard time wanting to know if she was still going to um, heaven and all kinds of rhetoric, in my opinion. But, you know, what we're standing on is what Abram stood on when he went out and stood as a witness and as a light of God. And, and we can't forget that. Now, while I would love to be raptured today, today I would love it, and I hope he does come. We don't know when that will happen. And we don't know if we will indeed have to go through some of those, but even if he doesn't save us, moments of faith. We're here where the rubber meets the road, y'all. And so there are times in our life we will have to stand up and war and take on the spiritual warfare. And that's just what Abram is doing right here. So um, let's just jump right back into that. Just a, you know, a little rabbit trail there for you. Um, so what happens is, I, I want to make mention, because I found this very interesting. Now, we've kind of gone through the Targum, and the Valley of, of Siddim is where they actually um, had this battle. Um, it was so good. There is so much in here that I would love to um, get into. Um, they actually... Here's some little thing, and, and I love this part, so I'm going to um, just mention this. Is, is Sedim is it's, it's in the valley, a very lush area, it was thought to be located at the southern end around the Dead Sea, um, where there were bitumen, um, bitumen deposits, um, and it's ex the tar pits. And so it's like asphalt, and slime pits, and as we know, it's it's very rich in that area with oil and natural resources. Um, but the valley was um, had many of these pits, and so I thought I, I it, it's the sick part of me. But the armies, many of the armies of Sodom and Gomorrah, actually fell into these slime pits when the other kings were coming upon them. They just fell right into those slime pits, and a lot of them, you know, just kind of ran towards the mountains. Um, but we're going to get into um, the destruction in our... Um, next session, not this session, part one or two, and you know, that's going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone, y'all, so the relevance of what we learn in Revelation is, is um, very thought-provoking, but there is conjecture that it was actually the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which actually brought out or evolved from what is now known as the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. So um, we hear that in um, Ezekiel, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. So we start with uh, Amraphael, you know, it's kind of got that spirit of Nimrod. Some people believe he was Nimrod. I uh, mentioned earlier that Esau actually is the one that killed Nimrod, but there's nothing in this particular chapter or any correlation that I could find as far as date stamping to really know if this guy was Nimrod or if he was the other king. Um, but what I wanted to really mention out to you is I went through each of these kings and I really hope, you know, there's so much that we cannot cover in these sessions, 
but I hope that you would read through each of these chapters. As I said, there's only 27, 24, 24 verses in chapter 14, but I went through each of the kings and they were giants, all kinds of giants in there. Um, 14th year, so the giants are the ruffians. And so if you read through these kings that came against these lands and the Jordan lands, plains, just promised land, full of giants. So some of these um, people that they went against um, were giants. They're... It, I'm going, to, I'm going to post these notes. I've got 12 pages of notes, and I've gotten this broke down into each of these that they've gone to with some really neat things, but they were all giants um, in some of these lands. Not, I mean, not everybody in, in this battle, this War of Thrones, the peoples were not all giants, but there were a great amount of giants. And I, I found that very um, interesting because um, I'd mentioned um, how, you know, there is speak of Nimrod, you know, kind of being a giant. So some of these kings may or may not have been, but uh, I didn't really understand that we would see these appearances of giants again until we got to Joshua where they essentially are going to run them all out again. So this same land that we're having with this War of Thrones is still going to be the exact same thing that Joshua is going to do. Even where Abram was, and we'll get that to a minute. So um, anyway, so they go in and they get Lot. Um, it was full of slum, slum pits. And we talked about the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah falling in there and Obviously didn't kill him because the king of Sodom is going to come back. Um, and so then um, Abram, we're going to get to the point in verse 13 where Abram rescues Lot. So what I wanted to mention was, um, and I think I did already, but it bears repeating, is that this is the first mention. And remember, first mentions are always significant because it gives us essentially a legend and an understanding of the context when these things are mentioned again throughout the rest of scripture. So it's exciting to see the very first time. And there came one that escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of memory. Um, talks about where he's from. Um, now, I wanted to mention, you know, of course, we know that, um, we know, I've, I've lost my train of thought here about, um, oh, the, the servants we talked about in last session, especially, um, as Abram was leaving, um, out of where the Lord had called him from. Um, about the proselytizing and about him being a witness and having these these people um, souls they refer to in Genesis a lot of time to people as souls I love that because that's what we are these bodies are just our tent so he had you know over 300 souls with him and again I can't really stress enough that um the sages expounding on Abram's um, thought or Abram's part is that the entire world was on one side and Abram was on the other. And gosh, doesn't that feel like us Christians now in the United States? And just the, it, it, it's just, it's hard to, to wrap around our brains, but it truly was a war of sanctification of God's name 
and also an expression of God's reverent fear and in heaven him knowing he did he wasn't looking for a city here he knew he was a pilgrim and passing through yet he stood up just like we are standing up y'all to sanctify God's name in this country and for fear and reverence of God and his word um a lot of these sages even um compare this particular war as um the episode they, they call it the episode i should call it an episode but the binding of isaac we're going to get into that soon um, where god calls um Abram to sacrifice Isaac. So the importance and the, the relevatory um, context of this is just as important as what that was. It was taking a stand against everyone who opposes God. You know, this was almost like David and who defies the armies of God and, and God who is this Philistine I mean this is as important y'all and so um, I love that that um, they can compare this because they say you know in, in Genesis but in also one of their targums, the or one of the rabbis, Bereshit Rabbah, 43, for I know that you fear God, you see. So, and even in James, it says, was not Abram our father justified works when he offered Isaac upon, his, upon the altar? I just, I just love that. So anyway, I want to go through these 300. Now remember, you know, so he's bringing up 318 of his own personal army that was born in his home, these soldiers, these followers. And I found it just quite relevant because, as you recall, Gideon had 300. Remember all those thousands he had? And the Lord had him go down there and drink in the water. And however they drank, you know, they got expelled, you know, because they weren't fit for battle honestly and this is the lord's battle just like this is this war of the thrones is the lord's battle this election is the lord's battle but he calls us to do something so what i found very interesting and this was so exciting i had to share it with you uh in regards to the numerology on the significance of 318 that were in Abram's army that he went up against. And so in the early church, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the commentators or scholars or, or whatever you want to call people who, who, you know, I guess, again, everybody can have an opinion and, um, so anyway, the, the 318 they used to kind of uh, signify as Eliezer's name, which was the faithful servant of Abram, because that's 318. Um, but actually, it signifies, and I was so wanting to find a picture of this to see as we looked at the 12 tribes and their positioning and all to see the cross. But this 318 also signifies Jesus on the cross. So the relevance of that. In Greek, um, it is the ta, T-A-U, which equals 300 and is equivalent to the Hebrew letter, the ta. And both of those represent the shape of the capital T. Um, which is closer to the shape of the crucifixion cross than the modern. So then the 18 comes from Ada plus Iota, which stood in the Greek alphabet order where Cheth and Volt stand in the Hebrew. So, and I'm going to continue to look uh, for a picture of this. 
um, even the epistle of Barnabas um, says that um, this was signified by um, two letters and the cross by one. So this signifies Jesus on the cross, y'all. This is another one of those hidden messages, and I'm desperately going to try and find a picture of this, even if I have to put it together on myself. You know, as I was reading this, though, well, the number 18, um, this is really strange. And you heard it here first. The 18 comes from Eta, E-T-A, plus Iota, I-O-T-A. And these are, um, their alphabets. But don't you find it very ironic? that these are the last two hurricanes that have been named. We just actually, um, Etta just hit here on the Florida coast. And the next one out there that they're tracking is Iota. Wow. Um, importantly, um, in the Greek, the Iota slash Etta and please look at my study notes. The iota slash um, eta are the first two letters of Jesus' name. <laughs> I wonder about those hurricanes now. Hey, I love that. Um, so I thought that's really important to know. As we know, numbers mean something. In the Bible, we have traced their meaning, and so many different things. Um, and so, he stands up, calls to action, takes his 300 men that actually signifies the Lord on the cross. We know now, I believe anyway, that he was taking a stand for God, a witness and a light of our true King, God of Creator, so that's awesome. So next, we're going to get to Melchizedek. And this is my favorite part. It's going to take a lot of time um, simply because it's so delightful. You guys are going to love it. You're going to love it. So I'm going to um, end this because as I look at my time, I'm already at 57 minutes. I knew it would take a, a while. Um, but I, I don't want to rush through Melchizedek. And so I'm going to go ahead and end this and take a break. You guys get some more coffee or some tea or something to drink. Um, and then meet me right back here for part two because I got to tell you, the best is even yet to come and what we're getting ready to excavate. Okay, love you guys. I'll see you soon. Very soon. Stay with me, okay? Stay with me and go to the part two, Genesis 14. Gonna blow your socks off, okay?